the, the really cool thing to hear about what we'll we discussing today. First one dated back to around 800 AD. Second one believed to be as old as 1,000 years BC. Yeah, a long, long, long time ago. So we'll learn more about exactly how these canoes were found, what's being done to preserve them, and the data and research being uh, invested in that as well. If you are watching today's presentation online, be sure to submit your questions in the Q&A section. You'll see that there's a comments tab and a Q&A section. So click Q&A, and we'll be able to disseminate those questions as we do get to the Q&A section after the presentation. Before we start, I'd like to introduce Clean Lakes Alliance Executive Director, a good friend, James Ty, talk more about today's speaker, and give us an update on the Clean Lakes Alliance organization. Hey, James. Thank you very much, Max. Um, just a little uh, thing to our online audience. Thank you for registering. Uh, we miss you. Unfortunately, we do have some technical issues going on with our audio. So hopefully you can hear us. Um, I would just like to say our apologies to that in advance. Um, thank you for joining us here at the Edgewater. It's a beautiful sunny day in, in Madison. Thank you, Max, for that. Uh, first, I'd like to thank our sponsors for Clean Lakes 101. Our presenting sponsor, First Weber and the First Weber Foundation and all their employees. Our hosting sponsor, The Edgewater, who provides us wonderful in-kind services uh, year-round. Also our supporting sponsor, Alliant Energy and National Guardian Life Insurance Company and our production partners uh, at the UW Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies and UW Extension Lakes by uh, Stevens Point. As Max said, we're happy to hear as WKOW is a sponsor and helping us get our, the word out to uh, south, uh, southern Wisconsin about the great work of our community towards improving our water quality. Uh, a few quick updates. First, um, it's really important uh, to get your friendship for the lakes and your support really matters to us. Those small individual donations, just like friends of public television, we have friends of Good Lakes and we love our lakes here in Madison. And we encourage you to become a, a sponsor and not waiting to the holidays, giving the executive director a, a panic attack at the end of the year, but think about giving those donor dollars earlier in the, in the year so that we can do work over the summer. Second, our annual Clean Lakes Lions community breakfast is coming up in a little less than two months. This is our every other year large community breakfast in Monument Terrace. Uh, we have nonprofit tables, individual tickets, and table sponsorships available May 3rd. Uh, we already have 70 tables signed up, so we expect to have a wonderful program for you that there today. Um, also, if you're interested, uh, we have a development director here, or you can reach to him uh, via email. Alex, uh, if you want to uh, learn more about how to help the organization through sponsorships. Uh, we also have at the breakfast, Samantha Skenadora from uh, a member of the Ho-Chunk Nation who will be our speaker. But moving on quickly after that is our annual Loop the Lake bike ride coming up on June 17th. It's a wonderful community ride around Lake Monona. It takes about an hour and 15 minutes. You can sign up for that online. You get your wonderful uh, free Land's End comfy t-shirt. And we also have food carts along the way that you can, it's part of your registration. You get a, a beverage and um, by Wisconsin distributors. As you know, every good ride or walk in the state of Wisconsin ends with a beer. And then also you can get some wonderful food along the way. Um, today's talk uh, is uh, about um, the canoes that we are all here, uh, to, uh, and Dr. Uh, Jim S. Skibo is here, from, and he's the State Wisconsin Historical Service Society uh, State Archaeologist. Uh, he's responsible for the state's 36,000 architectural sites uh, that talk about our rich history. He's currently working on a, a three year preservation process of the canoe at the State Historical Facility. He has wrote or edited 11 books, dozens of peer-reviewed articles on pottery, archaeological theory, and the archaeological of the Great Lakes. Uh, I have seen this presentation once before. Uh, this is also why I think you know, our staff uh, actually on their own said this is something that I think our, our donors and the community would like to hear more about. So we're excited to have him here today. 
uh, with this busy schedule. Uh, please welcome uh, Dr. James Skibo. Thank you very much, uh, James, for that great introduction. And thank you all for the great work you do. Um, when we were taking out the second canoe, I took it. I took it. Uh, we were floating along with it. I took two big gulps of Lake Mendota. So, you know, thank you. I'm still standing here. So, <laughs> um, so as James mentioned, I'm a state archaeologist and my primary job is to preserve and protect and tell the story of Wisconsin's past. Um, um, but, you know, we do other things too, some, some cool projects, and, and this is one of them. I've just been a state archaeologist for about a year and a half, and they hired me to be more outward facing, and, and uh, in this canoe, uh, these canoes are, uh, were gifts. Um, and I'll, so I'm going to talk about the how it was discovered. Um, our ongoing research, how we're preserving it, and how we're going to use the, the canoe uh, going forward. So, um, part of the first canoe was actually found by Tamara Thompson. Tamara is a uh, Hall of Fame diver, an international Hall of Fame diver. She's a member of our uh, maritime uh, archaeology team, which I supervise. And she found it in June of 2021, or May of 2021, before I even took the job. I started the job in July. And, um, you know, in our, our, our weekly meetings, they kept mentioning that they found a dugout canoe in, um, in, in Lake um, in Mendota. And I said, well, you know, I've heard these kinds of stories before, you know, Boy Scouts make dugout canoes and things like that. I just didn't think it was going to be old because wood, as you probably know, doesn't last very long in the water, right? Two years, 10 years. Uh, so I was very skeptical. And I said, well, show me a picture. Um, and this is the uh, picture, one of the pictures she showed. And she found it, she was just uh, diving, doing recreational diving. She lives on Lake Mendota, and when the water is clear in the spring, as you know, Lake Mendota can be pretty murky. Uh, she goes out, picks up, picks up trash, and does other things. And they have these things called scooters, these self-propulsion devices, and we're zipping along what's called a wall on Lake Mendota, just offshore, with this down. And she saw some wood sticking out, and she uncovered it. I don't know if you could read that. Uh, can these lights be turned on a little bit? It says dug out canoe. Um, she and her partner um, were um, uh, diving along. Yeah, she wrote in her underwater, she wrote dug out canoe. She is a maritime archaeologist. She spends most of her time, in fact, all of her time until now, uh, uh, doing shipwrecks in Lake Michigan and Lake, Lake Superior. Um, and, but she had started a study with uh, Dr. Cecil Schrader from the University of Wisconsin Anthropology Department on dugout canoes um, with the students. And so they had been looking at canoes across the state. And so she kind of had, had uh, an idea what these things looked like. So she uncovered it and, um, and there were some artifacts in, inside the canoe as well. And, you know, I said, that does look old, but, you know, let's, uh, Archaeologists don't like to be fooled, so I said, let's get a carbon-14 date, a way to accurately date the age of the wood. And so I went out and boat with uh, Tamara, and she went down, got a little piece of wood. We only need about a hair-sized piece of wood for carbon-14 dating. And it turned out to be dated to AD 800, a 1,200-year-old canoe um, that was built and floated and sunk during what's called the Effigy Mound period here in Wisconsin. And these artifacts turned out to be um, what we call net sinkers. They're the simplest of artifacts. Um, but they're, you know, when, when you have a net with float on, floats on top boards or something, you need to weight down the bottom. And they, 
get flat rocks. These are about the size of my hand. They they notch them. They don't even they can be natural, but they'll, they'll notch them so they can tie the cordage so the net will hang down. So the thinking was that there was a net actually attached to this, the net was all, and uh, the canoe um, uh, was preserved. And that's one of the ongoing mysteries why the, uh, a 1,200-year-old, you know, this is white oak, uh, uh, survived up until now. And so when I have told, when I got the date of 8,800, I, I walked into Christian Oberlin's office and I said, you know, because he knew that we we're going down to check it out. I said, this canoe is, it dates to uh, 1,200 years ago. And which is kind of amazing. Um, uh, and he said, do um, you think this is significant? I said, yes, it's significant, significant because it survives. It's the only one found in deep water and has associated artifacts. And, um, and I, he said, what do you think we should do? I thought, I think we should you know, try to bring it out. Because it, now that it's exposed, the reason why it's preserved, it's been buried for 1,200 years. Now it's become exposed for some reason, and now it's going to deteriorate. There's zebra mussels on it, and it's not, it won't last long. And so we talked to our tribal partners, especially the Ho Chunk, and they were in agreement that we should uh, bring it out. We've been working with them uh, throughout the process, and I'll talk more about that a little bit. And uh, he said, uh, Do you think you could bring it out? I said, uh, Sure. You know, <laughs> never done anything like this before. In fact, no canoe had ever been taken out um, uh, from this uh, deep. The tradition among Native Americans is to bury their dugout canoes in the shallow water, waist deep water in the wintertime or in the fall before the ice forms to hide them, to cache them, but also keep them protected from freezing and dying, and then come back in the spring uh, and recover them. The dugout canoes that we find in North America are ones that's, that, that people who live on the lakes uh, find in the shallow water. This was found in 27 feet of water, so the story's um, slightly different and much more difficult to, to bring out. And the first thing we wanted to do is to see if there were any artifacts associated with the dugout canoe. So we did some dredging. Amy Roseboro, the staff archaeologist you see here, we had Six weeks, when we decided to bring it out, we had six weeks until November 2nd when we did bring it out. And we did some dragging, which is a, it's a, it's a giant like vacuum down at the bottom, divers are at the bottom, sucking the, the, the dirt around the canoe away. And, um, and then we're screening it for artifacts. We did this for four days, no artifacts were found, no associated artifacts were found. So. Uh, we, we removed it. It was really sort of stuck in this clay. And then we got it loose about two days before um, we were going to bring it up. And November 2nd, uh, wasn't the, it was a beautiful day, but it was uh, 30 degrees. Uh, so it was a little bit nippy. Um, we started early in the morning. Uh, and it took us, oh, until 2 or 3 in the afternoon to bring it up. <coughs> Um, we, what we did is we went down and put a, like a, like a sling underneath the canoe made out of uh, canvas with handles on it and attached these dive, these four, um, lift bags. Um, we weren't sure how heavy this canoe would be. These, these, uh, dive bags could, uh, lift a car the, uh, from the bottom. So these, the canoe turned out to only be about 260 pounds. And uh, again, a beautiful day. So now the canoe's dangling four feet below the below the uh, uh, water. And we had been practicing this and, and working on how we're going to do this for weeks, um, staying up late at night planning how we pull this out. And the night before we we went out, um, the county decided. I guess on November first. Uh, they, they, they lower the level of Lake Mendota by two feet. We were going to pull it out at this boat launch, and we um, went into the boat launch that morning, and we, we couldn't get in. It was The water was too shallow. So we had to change the plan immediately, and so we decided to tow it to Spring Harbor Beach. 
and it was dangling underneath the um so it was a little bit farther uh and it was kind of you know i was worried that the thing was going to go back down uh dane county dive team helped us um and actually were the ones that pulled it you see the guy in front of the yellow is part of the purple onion film crew um another thing that that uh christian Oberlin said was that this is going to be our rosa parks movie he worked for the um uh, Henry Ford Museum outside of Detroit, and they actually purchased the Rosa Parks bus at one point, made national and international news. And I said, okay, you know, that'd be great. Um, I was, again, a little more skeptical because I've uh, been doing this a long time. Uh, but to their credit, the Wisconsin Historical Society hired this film documentary film team, were with us in the meetings and were with us uh, throughout the process. They're still with us uh, today on the, on the ongoing research. And uh, this is us bringing it out at, at Spring Harbor um, Beach. And um, this was a, a, this was a, a, a great moment. Uh, and it made me realize that maybe this Christian Overland was right, that this was going to be a bigger deal. We had invited some press to this and some historical society people were on the shore. But we really had not publicized that we're bringing it out. But uh, you know, we were just you know very close to shore with the, that Dane County dive boat, and they usually only dive for you know pulling snowmobiles or bodies out of water. So it it created a crowd uh, by the local homeowners and the dog walkers, and then on social media because it took us four hours to get from uh, the um, the canoe site back to the to shore. And so maybe 100 people had, had, had come to the beach. And at this moment, I realized I didn't know they were going to be there. They started clapping. Some people were crying. I thought, wow, this is something kind of unique. And it, I learned that, you know, as a state archaeologist, um, you know, people are more into it if they can participate in the process itself. So that was, a, you know, I learned something. There's Christian Oberlin right there and Bill Quackenbush, the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer for the Ho-Chunk. Uh, this was in the middle of when the worst part of COVID, and so we weren't able to collaborate as much as we did, but we lucked out because we're finding more canoes and we're working more closely with the Ho-Chunk. Uh, within 24 hours, there were 800 stories about this uh, canoe around the world in the Guardian, in London, in Australia, and Japan. Um, it was sort of shocking, in part because I think it's a cool story, um, for sure. But I also think there was so much bad news at the time that it was a fun story. And also it's a credit to our communications team at the Wisconsin Historical Society. And BBC's Time team, a television show in, um, in Great Britain, called the this canoe discovery one of the top 10 archaeological discoveries in the world in 2021 so kind of kind of amazing we thought the canoe was going to put up to be up to a thousand pounds based upon our research again it's turned up to 260 pounds so we had designed and built a vat um that could hold a, uh, something heavy like that, and that it could be lowered down with a with a forklift. Turns out we could lower it down by hand, and you can see this is a immediately after it came out, um, and it's being lowered into a vat. That um, you know, one of the great things I heard from Christian Overland during this process, he said, "Budget is no option. Yeah. Uh, there's, <laughs> you, you spend as much money as you want. Uh, great." And so uh, we knew we had to build this big long vat that could hold to be waterproof. And so we had six weeks. And so I started calling around all the people and the carpenters and, and builders, and I could get no one. We knew all the you know, it's hard to get people like this, they're all busy. And so Scott Roller, who you see with the black mask on the back, uh, is the collections manager at the State, State Archival Preservation Facility in um where the canoe is being stored and he and i said well let's just build it our thing and just from a picture we, we built it so um i couldn't spend the money you know <laughs> 
few months after that, we pulled it out and scanned it, and um, and uh, because now it's going to be in the preservation process for three up to three years, and so we can't take it out of the water. It's now in purified water. It could stay like that forever, but it needs to go through a preservation process. And uh, this is one of the scans. And there's just a couple things I want to point out. The sort of weather, there's, there's a one that has a hole in it that's a, where a notch had popped up. Uh, and the other end is, is degraded, and that's the end that Tammy saw uh, sticking out of the water, out of the sediment. And so, uh, but I want to point out a couple things. One, the um, it's about 15 feet long, and it's um, sort of flat. The older canoes are actually more like paddle boards than. Um, than the kind of canoes that we think of, and also um, you see how black it is on the inside. This is a, this is white oak, one of the hardest woods that you can find. And um, they at, at twelve hundred years ago, that's all they had was stone tools, which are good for a lot of things, but they're not great for shaping this kind of wood or cutting down large trees. So what they do is they use fire. And that's the, the dark, and all the canoes we're finding have this blackened inside. They burn it, it chars, then they bash it out with these malls, and then at the end, they use tools to, to shape it. We've done some estimates, and a canoe like this can handle about almost 300 pounds, so a couple of people and some fish. Um, and I mentioned the, the purple onion there, they, they've been around. Uh, yeah, all the activities uh, they've created some um, content already, and and um, and the canoe. This canoe has been selected as one of the three large items that's going to go into the new uh, history center that we're. Um, it's going to be on the Capitol Square in twenty in a couple of years. It'll be done. We've had a lot of visitors to the to the canoe, and I have this up here just to show you our team. From left to right, that's Caitlin Sant and our other maritime um, uh, archaeologist who's since left and took a job with Noah. Amy Roseborough, the staff archaeologist, and of course, First Lady and Governor Evers, and then Tammy Thompson. Um, the governor has visited twice um, uh, for the first canoe, and then also I'll talk about the second canoe as well. And, um, and in two occasions, the state uh, legislators and senators have visited as well. Um, here you can see a good picture of the bat. Um, it's um, it, we uh, we did something. I was kind of lazy. I think we built this bat. Um, we didn't have all the best tools, so but we decided let's just make it because uh, OSB and flywood is four feet wide. Let's make it four feet wide and four feet tall, which is way too wide for. Um, uh, this you know narrow canoe which is only 18 inches, and but I told Scott Rowland at the time, well, there's a room for another canoe, and that turned out to be true. So the canoe, uh, if we just pull out the canoe and um, let it dry, it would warp and crack and maybe fall apart completely. Sometimes you're lucky and they survive, but the canoe studies that we're doing now statewide, uh, most of the canoes. Are, will break up into, into many pieces. And the way that you, that you preserve it is that you replace the water in the cellular structure with polyethylene glycol or hay. And it's, um, it's added gradually to the water and by osmosis, it replaces the, um, the water in the cellular structure. So then it takes about two years and then gradually the water is, is replaced. And when it gets to 40% pay, it's going to be shipped to Texas A&M where they have this uh, giant um, um, freezer. Uh, we have to freeze dry it for two weeks. And that will take the remainder of the wood out, the remainder of the water out. And then we can lift it, we can, we can display it, we can move it without fear of it breaking, and it will be stable. In the meantime, Bill Quackenbush uh, in the Ho Chunk Nation had been, he'd been working on this dugout canoe for about three years with the youth of his community. And, you know, they'd work on it for a few hours and once a month or so, and it just was, it was going slow. And then when we found this dugout canoe, we said, you know, we need to finish this canoe and I need to take uh, our youth on a journey. 
from Lake Mendota all the way to Bloy. That was his plan. Build a dugout canoe and then and then paddle it with his youth from Lake Mendota all the way to the four lakes to the United to Bloy. And so they started working and then um, and they still weren't getting done. And so Bill finished it with a chainsaw. They were, they were doing it with some traditional techniques. But as Bill says, you know, Ocek would have had uh, chainsaws uh, 1,200 years ago, they would have used them. So he finished it with a chainsaw. And they did a couple of cool things. And we were allowed to paddle along with them. And you know, on, the right, on, the, on the right, you see that we're at the canoe site where the canoe was pulled out. And again, for the people that were on this trip, it was an emotional experience. Uh, Tammy was there, and I was there, and we gave a talk, Amy. And then we paddled all the way to the Tinny Locks, went to the Tinny Locks, which is kind of fun, actually. Never done that before. And then we went to the State Archival Preservation Facility, which is on the Ahara River. And then the, um, the people that were part of this group were able to see the uh, dugout canoe. And then uh, in May of 2022, again, Tammy Thompson is down and doing the same thing, picking up trash along the wall. And she sent me this text. And, um, and maybe some of you know Tammy. She's kind of a kidder. And I thought, yeah, right. Um, and I said, yeah, send me a picture. And this is what she sent. Um, another canoe right next to the, the last canoe. And um, it was not in good shape, as good shape. Uh, but I said, you know, it had the same characteristics, about the same length, about the same width, had a blackened interior. And I said, Tammy, we'll get a piece of wood and we will uh, get a carbon date. It takes about two weeks for a carbon date. And it came out to 1000 BC. It's a 3000 year old canoe, making it the second oldest dugout canoe in North America. And, um, you know, we, uh, we had planned for weeks prior to the first canoe and come up with a plan. We never thought we'd, we'd do, uh, have a do-over and we decided to do some things differently. Number one, we didn't use the Dane County divers. We just used our own divers. And also, you know, when I, we followed the first canoe, I told Tammy, and because we, my office is all this diving equipment. I said, well, I'm going to learn how to dive because we're going to find more canoes. I was kidding. But uh, in, in the process, I had learned how to uh, dive. And um, and we decided to come up with a different plan for the other canoe because it was actually in pieces. It's all there, mostly all there, but it's in pieces. So instead of dragging it underwater, which was um, uh, the scariest process, we decided to put it on an inflatable raft and float it over. This is when I go all the water, by the way. And um, this turned out to be a, a much better technique. Um, and, and also, we, since we had a do-over, we got uh, Bill Quackenbush and especially the Ho-Chunk, but also all of our travel partners involved. Uh, the Ho-Chunk were out there with a pontoon boat um, for this event. They were participating in all of our meetings. And um, so in this case, we did the same thing. We put the, we put the um, uh, sort of the tarp underneath it, floated it up, but then floated to shore, inflated these um, sophisticated um, um, raft, which is a, a queen size inflatable mattress from Walmart. And, um, and then, and it brought it out of the water and we towed it uh, with divers hanging on to the, to the edge of, the, uh, of it to keep it steady. As you can see here, it, it's broken up. Um, but if we wanted to, we, there's ways to put these things back together. And we may or may not do that. This one, it turns out, we think is Elm, another very hard wood. But a thousand BC in the same location. As I mentioned, the Ho Chunk and other tribal partners were around. They helped clean the canoe. They um, uh, they were given some time alone with the canoe. 
Um, and as we, as I'll talk about in a second, we are continuing to do some research together going forward. This is sort of a puzzle piece of the canoe put, that's put back together. Again, it's 1000 BC. The only piece that's missing is sort of this chunk in the middle, which we think um, was created by um, uh, an anchor. This is a popular place to fish. And uh, you know, through time, it's it's uh, it has some anchor scars on it, and I think one of the pieces got pulled out. Well, then there's another. There's a funny story here. I think there's another canoe. And uh, when Tammy and I were um, kind of going back to the site and cleaning up and marking the location and reporting things, um. um I was just her and I were going down. Now I'm a diver. She's probably been on, she dies every week, all year round, through the ice, in caves, in, you know, she's she's a nut. And this was, this was my eighth dive error. And so, you know, I'm learning, right? And so she said, just follow me down. Um, and, um, and, and I, so we're going down and there's, there's two sides of the story. The one is the one that Tammy tells, and then there's the official story. That <laughs> kind of story. Tammy's story is that I didn't stay with her because I was, you know, I'm a new diver and I'm just figuring stuff out and I, I drifted off to the side. And then I'm on the bottom trying to equalize and, you know, messing around. And then I see the Tammy's light go on. Uh, again, Lake Mendota is not very clear, as you know. Uh, we had about three or four feet of visibility, which is good. Um, and her light comes on, which means you should swim over to me. But I'm still messing around, you know, having some issues. And uh, and then finally she swims towards me and gives me this look, which means, you know, like, what the hell? What's the matter with you? Um, and then, but I was on my flapping around in the bottom, I uncovered some wood. Uh, so I like to think, if this is a canoe, um, we need to go back down and find out. I, I like to say that I discovered this one, but the, Tammy, Tammy then, after she gave me that look, started uncovering um, underneath me. Now oh, that's Tammy's story. The official story is, that goes into the report. I could set, as we were going down, I could sense something to my left, so I gracefully floated that way. <laughs> and, uh, I, I came down there and I I, I did some flapping in which uh, you know I'm going to patent this technique for finding canoes and uh, found this possible canoe which we dated to 8250. It's old wood. We need to get down there now and and uh, and see if it um, and see what it is. We can do that as soon as the ice breaks up. So this changes our story. We know that there is, and as we were, you know, feeling around down there, then we spent the rest of the time sort of just feeling, um, there's a lot of wood. And so this map shows all the archeological sites that date to uh, the times that the canoes were uh, around. The green ones, and uh, ones of the green and dot are effigy mounds, the other the green are the village sites. The sort of rust colored ones are from the archaic period, which is about a thousand BC. And one of the interesting things is these canoes are being found in the same location at, on, on, on what's called the wall. You're probably familiar with this because you, you um, study and, and have great interest in the four lakes, but there's this bench that goes out for about a hundred yards and then there's a deep, that's a pretty steep drop off. And that's where people like to fish, and that's where Tanya likes to pick up trash, and that's where she likes to find canoes. And, um, and so um, there's been some research on climate and water levels for Lake Mendota. And in 1000 BC, we know that it was um, 20 feet lower than the current level, which would be put us right at the shoreline at the top of the bench. Um, so, it's very likely that these canoes were buried just like everyone else does in the fall of the year. And, and then the water came up. 
Now, after 1000 BC, the climate change and the water comes up to its pre tinny lock um, levels. Um, but then there's, you know, as you know, the you know, Harbor River does not have a very big watershed. And there could be uh, two years or five years where the water would come way down. We're doing some studies now to try to figure to reconstruct that. Um, so that's one sort of working hypothesis for why these canoes are found in one spot. The other one uh, in Florida, where they found a cluster of canoes in, a, in one location, is because their thinking is in the Everglades and connecting lakes that they paddle to um, the, the last lake before the trail starts, and then they, they bury their canoes, and then they start walking on the trail system. And then over hundreds and thousands of years, uh, or, um, you know, there's canoes that never, people never come back, right? So, um, so they found up to 70 canoes in one location in Florida. So that could be the other thing. Um, people could be traveling and then perhaps going uh, west from here because you can't go west from here on, by water on a trail system. So that's something that we'll be considering. So this sort of illustrates the original water level and uh, would have been the, the water level 15 feet below uh, today and where the canoes are being found. So, um, so we decided to do some this winter with Bill Quackenbush. Bill Quackenbush, by happy coincidence, is an expert in ground penetrating radar, which is a technique for that can look through the ice, the snow, the water, and penetrate into the sediment below. And the sediment of Lake Mendota is ideal for ground penetrating radar because there's not a lot of rocks. There's not a lot of, um, uh, you know, it's basically silt and sand and clay. And so with ground penetrating radar, we should be able to get idea for some more canoes. Uh, and so that's what we did this, this past um, winter. We, we picked the two worst days of the winter. This, on this day, it's, it's below zero. Everybody has complex schedules. And you can see Bill there with his ground penetrating radar. And then I used some of my great uh, budget. I bought one of these uh, ice fishing tents. And you see us in there. And there's um, uh, Larry, Larry the Tipple from the Bad River up north. There's uh, Miranda from the Nominee. Uh, and then there's some Pochunk uh, representatives. And then Tammy and Amy and myself. And in this day, we were calibrating the um, the uh, the uh, device. Bill Quackenbush uses this exclusively to find places to bury their ancestors or their deceased, I should say, because they don't mark their graves in their cemetery. So when someone passes away, he's got to find an empty spot. He'd never done it over the water on the ice. And it turned out we were, um, we started to see some anomalies. And that's what you don't see. It's not, it doesn't send back pictures. It just sends, okay, this is what the, the ground sur surface looks like. And then, um, and then here's an anomaly, like a canoe. And we started to see some. And when we went back out on the second worst day of the year, when it rained uh, two inches, um, and we went out there, there was four inches of water and slush on top of the ice. I don't have pictures of this, but my feet are still closing. Um, and we did collect and set up a huge grid. And Bill's right now processing these data. And hopefully, we'll be able to see things we can check out this coming uh, spring. So that's that. And I don't know if we've had online questions or we're able to hear. Oh, good. First, though, round of applause, Dr. Peter. Fascinating talk. I know I've always wanted to know more about this. I'm sure that's why we have a panel class today, too. Uh, let's start with some Q&A. Uh, in person first, then we'll go virtual. But if we don't have any in person, hands up, hands up. Okay, we'll start here, and we'll go virtual. Uh, thanks, and great presentation. Entertaining as, as well as insightful. Um, as, a, as a novice when it comes to this stuff, I'm curious about carbon-14 dating and this data is awesome, right? And we're like, wow, it's almost too good to be true. For the naysayers or those that might question it, how can you talk about the validity 
carbon for heating. Wow, that's a that's that's a lot of big science, but I'll try to summarize it quickly. Carbon 14 dating is based upon the idea that all living things are, are absorbing carbon 14 constantly. Um, when we eat a plant, we get we get carbon 14 in us. When uh, and and trees um, uh, you know take carbon 14, take carbon dioxide and make it into oxygen. But when something dies, so everything living has carbon 14 in it. When something dies, you stop um, taking in carbon 14 and it starts to break down. And this guy in the 1950s won the Nobel Prize for figuring out the speed at which it breaks down. Because then they, it goes from carbon 14 to carbon 12. So you measure the relative amount of carbon 14 to carbon 12. And you get a range of dates. I said these dates exactly. Uh, they're more like um, AD 700 to AD um, uh, 900. You know, sometimes there's a 200 year um, range, but it's a tried and true technique. Uh, for the 1000 BC date, though, I sent it to two different labs because I thought. I, my reputation now is on the line. A thousand BC canoe. Um, let's just send it to two places. So I sent it to Beta Analytic in Florida and to a university in California that does carbon 14 dating. Got exactly the same date. So, um, but yeah, I, I, the reason why this wood is still around is that it's not been exposed to the light. Into oxygen and it's been buried. Now they're getting exposed and they're starting to break down. The 1000 BC one was more like thick, wet cardboard. I mean, it wouldn't, I don't think it would have lasted another year. So we caught it just the time. But a good question. Fascinating. Anna has some online questions for us now. Yeah, that was exactly. the, uh, oh, that was. That was essentially what somebody had asked online as well that they were uh how accurate the carbon 14 dating was but um a similar question was we found the two canoes so close to each other but they're significant amount of uh years apart is there any significance to that do we think they're from the same tribe yet they're that far dated apart the same time that they would, you know, they would have could one have lasted longer and they would have used it for a long time. Um, no, I, I think I think these canoes are being buried or cached. And it and this is a, in archaeology, this is what we call a persistent place. This place was being used and um as a site, as a habitation site for at least 3,000 years. And but there are other places like that. It's unique, but there are other places like that. There's a spring coming down right there. There's a nice flat spot. Another thing that ground penetrating radar could uh, um, tell us is, is is there a habitation site that now is underwater on that bench? And we did some work there. I'm hoping that we'll be able to see a buried village as well. It's a persistent place. Um, uh, and I think. My guess is there's more canoes from different time periods. Okay, some more questions. Got some more hands. No, I have one back here. We'll come back to the other one too. Again, thank you. Um, with climate change and the water warming, how does that affect the future of finding more canoes? Yeah, one of the questions is why are these canoes? Tammy's been diving on this for 20 years. And suddenly she's she found something. Either because she just it's always been there and she's noticed it, or they're, they're getting exposed. And they're certainly getting exposed. Why is that? And it might be because of um, the boat activity. And they're actually the canoes are kind of getting. We talked to some geologists and they say the canoes will are a law or anything heavy over a thousand years will by gravity go down and embankment underground. And they're hitting the bottom of this wall. And maybe that's part of it. But I also think the boat activity, especially the folks that do wakeboarding and they, they, they 
they, they create this a lot of this underwater disturbance. And also, because I was able to go down there, there's also a current. Some days there's a current, you're like drifting away. So, there's some things we don't understand why they're getting like exposed. And I also should mention that one of the best things about learning how to dive was to go down there for the excavation of the second canoe, um, which was which was done blind. Not only was visibility only about a foot, but then when you start stirring up the sediment, there was no visibility. And so the divers that were actually, I wasn't digging at this time, I was just trying to watching. Um, I get I great respect for that. I mean, they would come up, luckily it was shallow enough, they could come up and talk about it and go back down, but it was literally, they might as well have, been, have their eyes closed, really. Good question, though. <clears throat> do you plan to do a more systematic search of Mendota and other lakes in the Four Lake chain? One of the, uh, possibly, one of the things that um, this initial ground penetrator error will tell us is if there's, it's not this persistent place. Maybe in front of every village, there's going to be canoes. Um, and um, we'll do more ground penetrator radar uh, the, on the bench, on the likely places in the coming next winter, actually. I think that's possible. There could be, there could be these very canoes all over the, all four lakes have this bench. And this bench is represents an earlier um, um, lake's edge, basically. An online question from a group of second and third graders, which is always exciting. <laughs> they would like to know um, who built the canoes, would they have been male or female? And then in the same question, they want to know who would have traveled in the canoes. Good questions. You know, we, we can't, I can't tell you who built our canoes or who was in our canoes. But I can tell you that looking at the canoe manufacturer at the time of contact, it was the males making it predominantly. And since the one canoe had net sinkers in it, uh, I think this was probably a fit, you know, they were fishing with this canoe, which would be the oldest in evidence of net fishing inland in Wisconsin. We have net sinkers on the Great Lakes. This is the first, this would be the oldest inland evidence for net fishing. Um, and the canoes were used for, for transportation or, um, uh, you know, everyone, would, every family would have a canoe. Um, think about Wisconsin before the road system where the connected people were the waterways. Um, you know, they talk about Minnesota having 10,000 lakes and they make a big deal about it. Wisconsin's got 15,000 lakes. And we have two Great Lakes, Mississippi River, and lots of, and it's the way people got around. And you know, the birch bark canoes get all press, and they're up mostly up north, and it's, they're very light, they can be foraged. But for people who use birch bark canoes, they're constantly repairing them, sometimes every day. And the the um, the dugout canoes would have been like the pickup trucks of the past. They were tough. You could bang them into on rocks, you can drag them on the shore, you wouldn't have to worry about it. Um, so, and after watching Bill Quackenbush and his youth paddle it, it went through, they were going as fast as I was going in my kayak. So that's kind of impressive. I thought it would be more sluggish, but it went through the water really well, so it works great. So I have a sort of a question, sir, going maybe out a little bit larger beyond canoes. So obviously Madison is a special place going back 3000 plus years. You have uh, Native American Indian mounds, reportedly the most anywhere in the North America. Now we're finding about canoes. We're talking about how the lakes have changed. Has there ever been a talk of a more holistic look at the four lakes and why this is a spectral place, more of a Ken Burns documentary type thing where you have lots of different things going on um, that brought people here for thousands of years and why that was and tell that larger story. Yeah, actually 14,000 years. We have sites 
along the Tora Lakes that are 14,000 years old. The earliest evidence of, 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 of people in Wisconsin is about 14,000 years ago. So from the very beginning, there were people here. And you know, it's funny you should say that because I'm on one of the committees to create one of the galleries for the upcoming new history center, which is gonna replace the museum. And we're in the early stages, but we're thinking about doing something about uh, called We Are Here, because Madison has been, a, the, what we call Madison has been a special place for 14,000 years. And there's sites that represent all the periods of pre-contact and post-contact, and it's a seat of our government right now. So it's always been a special place. There's always been people living along the shores. The map I showed you is almost a Lake Mendota. It's almost one constant habitation site, and all four lakes are the same. So it's a special place, and yeah, I think that you know we're going to perhaps do something with the history center um, and tell that story a little more than it's been done before. Yeah, maybe we are here to be like WI. Right. Uh, I saw some hands on this side of the room. Don't want to forget anyone. Maybe some of the questions were already answered. Okay. And then we have a couple more online, and uh, I'll probably have to wrap this up here because it's almost done. Yeah. Do you have an estimate of when we might be able to see the canoe on display? Um, I uh, it would be the new history center, twenty twenty seven. I mean, if you uh, if you call, um, and I can get you, you know, you could, you could have tours arranged as well to foundations if you wanted to do a, a tour of the State Archive and Preservation Facility, which they do occasionally. I mean, it's it's they, it's not a regular thing, but it's an amazing facility. Not bad there. Uh, but 2027 is when they'll be on display. Our, we'll start doing more, another, we're going to have another press um, release uh, with the, uh, I'm talking about some of the uh, research coming up, so you hear more about it then. I should mention also one more thing is, is pretty cool. Because we scan the canoes and we can't look at them anymore, bring them up, you can print out the exact replicas of the canoes. We print it up, print it out the ones that are about this big. But you can print out a full size one. You could even make one out of white oak. Exactly. And I think that's also a great thing, especially for children. The second and third graders, I know, would probably love to jump at a dugout in the path of the history center. Or actually put one in the water. So I think there's all kinds of possibilities. Do you have another? Yes, one. I was wondering about this ground penetrating radar. Would it be possible to uh, do that in the summertime, loading the device over the water, or do you have to do it on uh, on the ice? There has been some folks that have tried that, um, so I think it is technically possible. I it has to calm and I mean it it works well to the ice, and what you have to do is it's like a lawnmower and you have to put a grid out and every five feet you have to go back and forth. And when you're floating in a boat, you just can't maintain that level of accuracy. Um, so it is possible and you know, I'm exploring other things to do. Theoretically, you could put it underwater um, and maybe I'm gonna use some of my unlimited budget to get one of those things. <laughs> Got a question online. Um, somebody has been following Wisconsin Historical Society, Society staff via social media. So I'm just so excited to hear. And it's, it appears that you've been going around the state, maybe other states, uh, scanning other canoes. Can you tell us what you found? Yeah, this was, I, I alluded to this a little bit earlier. Um, about three years ago, there was a, a, a student, yeah, Dr. Cecil Schrader, student who wanted to do something about canoes in Wisconsin as a senior thesis. And they said, well, why don't you find out where all the canoes are in the state, just start, you know. And we knew of 11 at that point. And then after we found the 
first canoe, and we thought, well, that, we should ratchet this up. And so Cisco Schrader and Tammy Thompson have been traveling around the state. And what started with 11 canoes is now over 70 canoes. They were just up at Shano scanning. So they scan them, they get a wood sample for carbon 14 and wood analysis. And at some point, we'll, we'll have all those data as well. And then also we're getting calls from people like, I've seen a dugout canoe in the water from divers or from kayakers. So this spring will also be ground truthing and diving in other lakes, uh, um, checking these uh, canoes out. Probably not pulling any more out. Um, yeah, I think we're just going to record, uh, in, unless it turns out to be very significant, very old. But because it's very expensive, up to hundred thousand dollars to preserve these two canoes. So, you know, I guess maybe there is a limit to my budget. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, with this unlimited budget that you keep mentioning, <laughs> have you considered cultivating someone on your staff that is tribal and is Ho Chunk, as these are the people of the big points? So that it is their voice that speaks on the other side of the microphone from time to time, so that they're able to tell their own story. And wondering if, and knowing Bill personally, and how he is so stretched from the state, and you know this as well as I do, um, perhaps over the course of seasons to have a conversation with him so that someone who holds the spirit can speak as you do and to do this work and that you could perhaps gift your knowledge and your capacity back to the tribes so that they can cooperate with you in a good way. In the constant communication with Bill Clark, I wish we've done two presentations jointly, and we're going in, in this month, we're doing two more presentations jointly. So we do them all the time. He does talks on his own about the canoe journey. Um, he's very supportive, so we're working together. I mean, without their uh, support um, without their enthusiasm about this, um, we, we wouldn't be doing this project. And later next week, we have the Wisconsin Inter Tribal Repatriation Committee, which meets quarterly. The 12 TIPOs are tribal historic preservation officers in the state meet quarterly. And they're going to be meeting at the state archive and preservation facility because they want to chance to see the canoe in the facility. Um, so we have ongoing discussions with our tribal partners um, and, and Bill's a great speaker and we do a great I think a great tag team talk as well. Uh, Tammy, we have been doing lots of talks and so and Bill's very busy and Tammy's been doing talks I've been doing talks with Tammy um, so we have to we, have, we can't we, we can't uh, be great if Bill's around for all the talks. We're doing ad advocacy day next week at the Capitol with Bill, so um, and there'll probably be more uh, talks as well. So, good question. Yeah, great last question to allow us to be looking forward. One final round of applause for Dr. Steve coming in and Dr. Dr. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks everyone for coming on in. We're taking it right up to the wire this morning. Uh, we. Uh, if you didn't get your question answered, I know there might be more, you can email them to info at cleanlakesalliance.org and those we pass along to those that can answer them. Again, that's info at cleanlakesalliance.org. Remember to secure your ticket for the May Community Breakfast and June's Loop the Lake bike ride coming on up. You can find those online. And a programming note, next month's Clean Lakes 101 Science Cafe will be Thursday, April 13th. And that's one day later than the usual second Wednesday of the month. So if you want to grab your phones, put that in there. Again, that will be coming up Thursday, April 13th versus Wednesday, the 12th. And keep an eye on your email for a topic and registration details, TBD. And once again, thank you everyone for joining us. Great round of questions and another great talk. Thanks so much. Right.